Welcome everyone to a lecture on angular relations and times and solar energy. Uh, this is part of our course material for uh, design of solar energy conversion systems. Uh, the undergraduate class, EGEE 437, that's taking it right now, uh, could benefit from the materials that we have in our open online graduate course, EME 810, that's Solar Resource Assessment and Economics. Uh, you're welcome to go to that site uh, listed above and see the tutorial videos on the site uh, that would be in Lesson 2. And I believe it could help you for finishing up your homework for uh, 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 that would go ahead of these lectures as well. Also, keep in mind that uh, the reading is based on chapters 6 and 7, and if you are not reading along and taking notes for this, uh, you're really in for some challenges here. So uh, I encourage you, strongly encourage you, to be reading, taking notes, and using that textbook as a part of your research, resources. All right, let's carry on. So chapter 6 is uh, really introducing us to uh, what we'd call spherical trigonometry. It's the basis of relationships in time and space inside of uh, solar, sun, earth, and atmosphere relationships. I really want you to read all of chapter 6 and then continue on to chapter 7. I want you to keep in mind what we're looking at here. We're looking at the goal of solar design. And inside of solar design, we are looking to uh, find or seek out that highest preference for solar goods and services, that is, maximizing solar utility for your client or stakeholders in a given locale. And in order to do that, we're going to now introduce some tools to uh, enhance or increase that ability for you to find or seek out that, that client's preference for solar goods and services. Now, the way that we're going to look at it in this first batch of, of optimizations or changes in solar design is going to be based on angular relationships and, and how a solar collector interacts with the uh, positioning relative to the sun and relative to the changes in the uh, time of day and whether or not we use tracking and to uh, convey even uh, aspects of shading that might be coming into play. So the goal of, of solar design tied to, say, the uh, a preferential goal in many solar energy conversion systems to gain that solar energy, to get, and we call it a solar gain, to deliver solar energy into the system would be to, one, reduce what we'd call the cosine projection effect. Early on in the textbook and in our lecture materials, we've known that the cosine projection effect is a factor of the sun, the angle of the beam of the sun relative to the aperture or the receiver of our solar energy conversion system. If the sun is projected across a low uh, grazing angle or a high angle of incidence, one would say, then for a high angle of incidence there would be a large cosine projection effect and effectively less photons would be uh, in incident upon our solar conversion device. So we want to reduce this, the cosine projection effect in some way. We want to also uh, reduce what we call the angle of incidence. So the angle of incidence is of course the angle between the beam of the sun, the, the direct normal irradiance, the beam coming from the sun, and the normal vector, uh, that is the, the line perpendicular to the flat plate of our, of our panel. So reducing the angle of incidence, effectively saying point the panel at the sun. Um, and third, we want to reduce any losses that might come from shadows. Right, So we reduce the cosine projection effect. That's going to be a large-scale, seasonal, kind of, uh, if not annual, uh, orientation of our collectors. Reducing the angle of incidence is more of a fine-tuning of that larger cosine projection effect. And then we also want to, when we want solar gains, we want to reduce losses from shadows, from trees, from obstructing objects. And we're going to, in order to do those things, we're going to need to know about angular relationships and the way that angles and time are one in solar energy design. All right, so let's carry on. What we're going to start with is the basics, which is uh, what are going to be the core spatial relations? Uh, what are our coordinate systems that we're going to use in this class? The spatial relationships are the ABCs, or in Greek, the alpha, beta, gammas. So in uh, solar 
conventions, we use some uh, pretty regular Greek uh, characters f to represent different angular relationships. The first three, alpha, beta, and gamma, are dealing with altitude angle, that is the angle from the sun up into, from the, uh, excuse me, from the horizon up into the sky of, of any object, be it the sun, which would be the altitude angle with a subscript S that you're seeing right in the diagram on the right, or the altitude angle from the ground up of any obstruction, such as like a tree, the top of a tree or the top of a building. The next uh, spatial relation, the angle, is the slope or the tilt of our panels. Here you're seeing a diagram of a photovoltaic panel. The slope or tilt is in degrees, and that would be beta. So notice that alpha is the angle up in front of our panel, and beta is the tilt upward from horizontal towards vertical. So a beta of zero degrees would be a flat panel horizontal on the ground, and a beta of 90 degrees would be a vertical wall on a building, say. Now azimuth is the tricky one. Azimuth is gamma. Azimuth is that rotation uh, of, around the ground. So we're rotating clockwise, in this case, from the uh, north towards the south, or towards the equator in this case, uh, and that rotation is the azimuth. So rotation is independent of tilt. Tilt is up and down, rotation is along a horizontal plane. And we're going to need those two independent coordinates to convey the very familiar XYZ coordinates uh, that, that uh, you're going to see in just a moment. That leaves us with uh, two other angles that are uh, not directly represented that we're going to draw in here in just a moment there. Uh, that is the angle of incidence. The angle of incidence, of course, would be the angle between the normal of the collector, which might be this very small line going right out here, and the angle of the beam of the sun, or the direct normal irradiance of the sun. That uh, angle is uh, the angle of incidence, the angle directly vertical from the sky towards that beam of the sun, that's the zenith angle. So notice that it's not quite the same thing as the zenith angle is not necessarily the same thing as the angle of incidence. What you're seeing writing now is a representation of the transformation of our alpha, beta, gamma coordinates to x, y, and z coordinates. So we're dealing in spherical coordinates. And just like spherical coordinates, we have a transformation system to turn that into x, y, and z. Uh, the z-axis it would, be, of course, be the cosine of the zenith angle or the sine of the complement of that angle. So the cosine of an angle is equal to the sine of the complement of that angle. And as you're seeing right here, the zenith angle is in red, and the altitude angle here is represented in orange. It's the complement of that just below it. So those are where those two angles are coming in, and this is where alpha is given a special representation of alpha of the altitude angle of the sun with a subscript s, just as gamma sub s is the azimuth angle of the sun. Okay, so take a look at those angles. They're on page 142, uh, listed in uh, the equation 6.1. Uh, it just you'll start seeing those general relationships popping up into our uh, future uh, equations, and it's just worth noticing that that we're really just representing x, y, and z relationships here. Now, once I've got the kind of basics of alpha, beta, and gamma of the collector, I'm going to pull us way out into looking at the relationship between the Earth and the Sun. And so I've got Earth and Sun angles represented here in this figure 6.5 on page 143 of our textbook, Solar Energy Conversion Systems. The, once again, we're going to use some Greek letters. I'm going to use the Greek letter phi for latitude and lambda for longitude. 
when I'm representing latitude and longitude, I've got to distinguish which one's positive and which one's negative. So I've got a positive latitude north of the equator, a negative latitude sign convention south of the equator. Similarly, for longitude, we define longitude according to the basis of the prime meridian. That's the prime meridian uh, running north to south uh, through Great Britain, uh, and that would be where zero degrees longitude starts. That's also where we would begin our universal time coordinate system, UTC. Going negative, going towards the west, is negative. So westward is a negative 15 degrees for every standard meridian that we go beyond the prime meridian. So every 15 degrees of longitude there is a new standard meridian. Every plus 15 degrees there's another standard meridian uh, going towards the east. That's the, the sign convention that we'll be using. Delta is used specifically for declination. Now declination is the relative tilt of the Earth's axis uh, according to the ecliptic, according to the plane of uh, the Earth-Sun orbit. Now that uh, declination, that tilt, it goes to an extreme of 23.45 degrees. And it has extremes on either side of the year, and it occurs at the two dates that you're very familiar with, the summer and winter solstice. solstice. The summer solstice in North America is plus 23.45 degrees. The summer solstice in South America is minus 23.45 degrees. Uh, we're going to calculate declination in a way that is independent on, of where you are on the planet. Declination is actually just going to tell us what time of the year we are in terms of days. And uh, to do that, we're going to actually need the day of the year. We're going to use the day uh, N going to look it up or calculate it uh, from table 6.1 on page 144. You input the day of the year anywhere on the planet, northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere. It will tell you plus or minus uh, 23.45 degrees or less. And if you are at zero, you are at the equinox, one or the other. And if you're at the two extremes, you have reached one or the other solstices, independent of the location on the planet. The last symbol for Earth-Sun angles is the hour angle. And the hour angle is a little bit strange, but we're going to really dig into this uh, shortly. So the hour angle is translating time into an angle. You're not going to see the hour angle. You're not going to have a plot of the hour angle. You just need to know that for every 15 degrees in angle, in, in that spherical coordinate system, for every 15 degrees of translation, one hour will have passed. So, uh, and if I were standing on the surface of the Earth looking up, let's, I would imagine a great big middle kind of line running across from north to south, across that sky dome, across the sky. Imagine a line going from north to south as I look up into the sky. That line, that, that line is the zenith. I mean, if the very top of the sky dome is the zenith, that line cross-cutting the zenith and going down to the horizon is going to be a meridian. It's going to be our local meridian. And that meridian, if I were to go and look at that meridian and look off toward the east, let's say I'm facing south and I'm looking off toward the east, I would be looking in negative degrees. So if I were to go 15 degrees of angle across that sky dome, I would count backwards one hour. Similarly, if I were to go 15 degrees after that meridian, post-meridian, let's say, that would be PM. That would be plus 15 degrees. Okay, so it's a way that we're going to use the hour, or the moment, let's say, that the sun is at the noon hour, at its uh, apex in the, in the sky, in the sky dome, at any day. That will be an, an hour angle of zero, and then we're going to have that as the basis, and then either subtract hour angles in degrees, for earlier in the day or add our angles for later in the day. And we'll do some explanation of that very shortly. So let's think about a process here because what we're leading up to is kind of how do I start thinking about these angles and where do I get this information to actually start uh, solving problems once I uh, uh, get some questions here. Well first, latitude and longitude. 
latitude and longitude, uh, what we want you to look up and what we want you to enter into uh, coding software is decimal form lat long. To do so, go to Google. Go to one of your basic search engines and search latitude, longitude, and then State College, Pennsylvania. You'll immediately get a quick result of decimal based uh, latitude and longitude. Next, how do I find the declination? Declination is solely based on the day number. So you need a day number from 1 to 365. No leap years inside of these uh, calculations are necessary. You go from 1 to 365, you enter the day number, and the day number is then uh, plotted into equation 6.2 in your textbook. This equation 6.2 right here is a using a sign with a degree based argument this is not a radian argument this is a degree based argument so if you are using MATLAB or Scilab or a one of our converters inside of Python this is where you would use the sine D function for this calculation so I'd find latitude and longitude with a quick search I'd find declination by just finding the day number independent of the latitude and longitude and then I'm going to look at something about declination and just make a little mention. Uh, we'll come back to this at another time. But it's interesting to note that declination is basically a sinusoidal function. It, it oscillates from plus or minus 23.45 degrees. And the derivative that would tell us the rate of that oscillation is going to be a cosine function, which would show that the change in that declination, say the day-by-day -day changes in declination, it tells us about the way that the Sun and the Earth are interacting and the length of daylight and the length of nighttime that happens throughout the year. And the interesting thing is, it's not constant. It actually changes. The declination change, the change in the declination, is slowest near the solstices and faster, in fact the fastest, right around the equinoxes. So you're seeing a plot here on the right uh, that's in the textbook and it's basically binning the days of the year, how many days of the year will hold for uh, a certain range of declination. I think we had uh, four to six degrees in here, something like this. Uh, oh yeah, six degrees. The, so f f for the declination change to hold within six degrees that's 81 days of very, very slow declination change around the winter and 81 days of very slow declination change around the summer. Those are the minus and the positive 20. And that means, that really means that in the summer when you were a kid and the days seemed so long and they just seemed to go on forever, they really were doing that because the declination was changing very slowly and in the winter time especially when you're in the in the in the northern parts of the world when winter nights just seem to last forever and ever and ever they really are lasting a long time the declination change is very very slow it's only right around the times when we get near the equinoxes the autumn and the falls if we're uh, say in the mid-atlantic region like we are here is when you actually start to see things changing quickly in terms of the length of the day it's a real phenomena that we've all kind of culturally built in to think of as something that's you know just you, you know, it's feeling like uh, the summer days were longer as a kid. They really were. The nights are really longer in the winter, and uh, they will remain so whether you're a kid or uh, an older, more mature adult. All right? Fascinating stuff there. So um, what we've got coming up is going to be uh, the third step to this, which is how do I... Uh, do a calculation for the hour angle, right? And, and to do that, we're going to uh, look at equations 6.4 and 6.5, but I think I'm going to hold off on that and uh, discuss that in the next lecture, which will be immediately following up and you can access. And I just want to remind you that if the time of the hour angle is 15 degrees per hour, that would mean that we would be experiencing one degree of change for every four minutes, or four minutes 
would have to occur per one degree of rotation of some large body. And that leaves us with this question, which is what do we know that's out there that's really large that rotates and spins at about one degree every four minutes. All right. Thanks for your time, folks.